Let's open the scriptures together to the book of Acts, chapter 2, where we'll read the first 13 verses. Acts, chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and uh, including 13. The word of the Lord from us today that uh, reminds us of what happened uh, on uh, on those uh, those beautiful moments 2,000 years ago in uh, Jerusalem, and we believe that they can repeat uh, here with us today. Uh, you're there. Let's uh, let's open up to Acts chapter two, as I said, and let's uh, let's read together. When the day of Pentecost came. They were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blow, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there, now there were sitting in, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in the bewilderment because each, of, each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galilee, Ga Galileans? Then how is it that each of them... Thou, now, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Perithians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and, and Asia, Phrygia and uh, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and, com both Jews and, convert and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have too much wine. You can each uh, sit back down. I'm very happy that we can all each uh, rejoice. Rejoice here at the celebration of, of Pentecost. The Lord has kept us uh, uh, alive and healthy and, and uh, given us the time to, the opportunity to celebrate this, this uh, beautiful these beautiful moments here together we want to read this passage and from this as from the passage that we read we want to learn something and something to adapt and to, to add to our own lives the celebration of Pentecost the, these events uh, is one of the most amazing and beautiful events that have happened in the history of the church looked from every angle this event was completely spectacular and uh, an extraordinary event a, a event that, uh, that is out of the norm. You know that the Jews were obliged uh, for about three times a year, all the Jewish men, starting from the kids from 12 years and over, they were obliged by law to celebrate in Jerusalem. There, was three th there were three celebrations that all Jews had to go to Jerusalem, to the temple to celebrate. It's uh, the, the celebration of Passover, of Easter, when, when uh, Jesus was uh, killed in Jerusalem, there were Jews from the whole Roman Empire, the whole known world at the time. There was a celebration of Easter, the celebration of tents, the celebration of, of the rising bread, the tents that are one after the other, and there was the celebration of, uh, of um, you know, the country of Israel is a special country from every uh, uh, angle, including the fact that it has more harvest per year. Not like in Romania where once a year the, the wheat is made and... No, in Israel things uh, are harvested more than once a year based on the, circ on the circuit. At least twice a year everything is, is, is made. And they celebrate this uh, celebration of, of harvests. Um, the celebration was marked the end of uh, the, the wheat harvesting, the food harvesting. They celebrated the end of... of uh, they celebrated that God had given them good weather, good soil to, to grow their, their, their crops. And the biblical symbolism, if you uh, look into it, that in that celebration, when the Jews uh, would, would celebrate the end of, of uh, their harvesting, God celebrates with His church the first uh, planting of the Spirit. At least 3,000 people uh, were joined to the church in a single day. The Lord planted in, in their hearts the, the seed of the Holy Spirit. So as the Jews were celebrating the harvesting, uh, 
God makes this celebration one of of saving souls, one of of because true wealth is not these things that die, but the true harvest is is our eternal souls. So, as the spirit came down, the the harvests were transformed into the first celebration of of uh, Pentecost for the first time in the history of the church. It was the first the first mass uh, uh, repentance. Maybe many times we don't understand what three thousand means. You know, here in this room, we're approximately two hundred and eighty people. Besides the fact of the people that uh, snuck in, let's say we're around 300. Now imagine that there's 10 times uh, as many people as there are here in this room. That's how many people turn back to God. A church was born 10 times bigger than than, uh, than we are. Uh, God turned back to God. God got a, 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 a huge amount of people to, to repent on that day. We cannot make a direct relationship between uh, this um, falling of the spirit over the, the the spirit of the Lord falls and strengthens people and and does something with them, changes them, that makes them capable, that they're they're preaching to have an impact, an impressive impact, and the conversion of a, a massive amount of people. You know, this wasn't the first time Jesus, uh, the, 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 the apostles would preach about Jesus. It, this news that Jesus uh, resurrected wasn't, an, 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 uh, wasn't something new that they were hearing for the first time. Do you guys think that the soldiers managed to keep for them this event and it wasn't uh, found out in the city? Everyone knew. Rumors and the story would, would fly by. Everyone knew about this potential resurrection. It was a, a, a piece of information that was public back then. It wasn't the first time when people would hear about Jesus. It wasn't the first time when people would hear that Jesus is potentially the Messiah. But in this sermon of, of Peter's, in this uh, uh, word, there was something more than just the information. It was something that happened with them a few hours before. And it was this filling, this supernatural filling of the Holy Spirit that made this message of the gospel to have a special and, and, and amazing impact. There's a direct relationship between this manifestation, the supernatural manifestation, and the, the, the spiritual harvesting that happened. We want to look uh, carefully at this word of the Lord and to discover together what what do these uh, supernatural manifestations mean that happened on that day? What do these mean? The, you know the ways that the Holy Spirit of the, of the Lord revealed over the the apostles. Why were these signs needed? What symbols do they represent? And I want to tell you guys that it's important to to look into this because. The same solution that God had uh, for His church 2,000 years, 2, years ago may still be valid and, and usable today. It might be possible that the same method that God chose to use 2,000 years ago at the celebration of Pentecost, it might be the same method that God wants to use with us. You know, I want to ask you something, and let's be sincere. For example, if you have a way to resolve a problem, I don't know whether it be if you're a mechanic, a builder, a... a IT technician, whatever your job is, and you have a, you discovered a way to resolve a problem. And you've used it tens of times, thousands of times, and it works every time. Why would you change it? When someone comes and asks, you know, you, you, you can do this, but you say, you know, I don't care, I've done this thousands of times, why should I use a method that might not work? We have the same way of thinking. When we have things that we tested, we checked, and they they function, we have no reason to change them. I want to tell you the same. God works in the same way. God has a method, a plan, of way of working that is functional, that has has proven itself throughout history. The apostles, the disciples, were people that had a basic educational level. Most of them, people that weren't one scholars they didn't have an amazing education didn't have amazing resources but had something different that was enough that in less than 50 years to lift the world upside down an author was saying that uh, that we wrote that, wrote that um, an author wrote that God turned, managed to turn the world upside down managed to, to change the world with 12 people that 
you know, just 12 people in sandals. We have a bunch of, edu our education level today is, is huge. We know so many different bits of information, but we don't have the same impact that the, these people had back then. Because we forget that we're not the missionaries. God is the missionary. God has the plan to save people, not us. Because if it was after us, you know, we'd, we'd make it, you know, as sure as possible to guarantee, uh, to, to lock the doors, to conserve, to, to take care of, our, of one another. But God wants us to go out into the world and to change people. But many times we try to do it with our own methods, with our own plans, with our own resources, when in fact God has a plan that is functional and has worked throughout history, starting with this day of Pentecost. I don't see why God would substitute this, this method of working with, with, any, with any other when This method is used over and over again in, in uh, the New Testament. This isn't a unique thing what happened here in Acts, but it's something that, hap that, that happens over and over again with consistency. You know, in Acts 4, once again they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, in the house of Cornelius, the same scene. Then in Acts 19, Paul in, uh, in Ephesus, the same scene. The disciples were in a journey. What, what journey? A simple one. Man was confronted with the gospel, preached, with, preached it with authority, with the power of the Holy Spirit, was uh, conquered by the gospel. The man would believe the gospel, would repent, was born again, was baptized in the water, and then immediately they'd be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, the Samaritans are converted and then immediately the apostles go and they ask, they feel the need for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit as they themselves were filled with it and in the day of Pentecost. <coughs> Sorry. Why did the apostles feel the need to do this? Because maybe they knew something that we don't today. Without this supernatural filling, without this power, we are unable to fulfill God's plan. That's why we feel so impoverished by this. this we feel so, so burdened by this need to speak to others, to be witnesses of Christ, to, to testify Christ's truth. You know, why does God ask us to, to baptize publicly in water? You know, why, is, why don't we each uh, have a mobile little bathtub and, and put it in a van and baptize you at home or in your garden? Why does God ask us to do it publicly? Because Christian witness, Christian testimony needs to be public. God expects you to, to praise yourself with Him, to walk with Him, to walk in, in His love outside, to live amongst your colleagues, amongst, amongst your, your, your family, amongst your friends, with Him, to pride yourself with Him, to, to praise yourself with Him, to boast that you have a God, an amazing God. We want to look at what these uh, supernatural signs mean that happened back then and what their effects were. The scripture says that in the day of Pentecost, in the day of Pentecost, they were all there in the same place. They were all together in one place. We can't uh, omit this detail. Look with me in the scripture. I hope that you guys have the Bibles uh, with you guys. I want to see that you guys are bringing your Bible with you more, more regularly. It's important. You know, that way you can visualize the text and, and remember it. In the day of Pentecost, they were all there together. It's an important detail. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house they were sitting in. So the Spirit had came in this, this uh, nucleus, this, this uh, gathering of people. You know what used to happen? Look in Acts 1. Go one page backwards and go to Acts 1, 14. And look what they were doing. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus. They had the same desire. They were all together praying. So even Jesus' family and the disciples and the, the, the larger circle that uh, uh, were with the women that were with Jesus along his work, all together, all of them together. Unity and, and, and prayer were the context that the disciples received the, uh, the Lord's Holy Spirit. Unity and prayer. We expect the same promise and that's what we declare. That's what we've declared this morning. You know, God fill us with your Holy Spirit. Say Amen. We were waiting for the same, the same result. Why do we believe sometimes that we can receive it in any other context? Does it not seem interesting? You know, and there's this story 
and I hear it more often, you know, can God not fill me with the Holy Spirit at home when I'm praying? And yes, He can. But if you look at the, the biblical model, they were together and they were praying together. The context that the Holy Spirit comes in, and look in the scriptures onwards, Acts 4, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. None of them is at home by himself, but all of them were together with other people. That's why when we call you to come to pray, it's not because God cannot fill you with the Holy Spirit at home. He can do it. But the Lord calls you to rebuild the context. God has methods that have worked for 2,000 years. Only we, we're the ones that want to change them. And I hear this story more and more. But you know, why do I need the church? Can I not be faithful at home at my house? Yes, you can. No one stops you. But remember, you cannot replace the church. You cannot replace the context that God has. We didn't invent churches. We didn't invent this gathering here to, to praise Him. He is the inventor of the church, not us. We didn't invent that we need to gather Sunday mornings to pray, but God created this. He taught the apostles to, to stand together, to wait together, to pray together. They were together and they were praying. There were two essential conditions. Because together, when we pray, there's a completely different context. There's a, 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 a completely different thing that happens than what happens when you're at home and you pray. That's why we call you Friday evenings from 7.30 to pray. Because there's something else. There's something different happening. No, it's great to pray at home, but at church there's something different. Something else happens. You experience something different. You live something different. No matter how many times we gather up to pray, you know what truly happens? The, this context is recreated where the Holy Spirit of the Lord can, can fall down on us as, as back then. Whenever we're together, this happens. It wasn't the first time that they were praying and that's why you say maybe, you know, you know, I've come and I've prayed but nothing happened. Do you guys think that this was the first time that happened for them? No, it was something that, that used to happen. It was a norm. You know, Christ told, Christ told them, you know, come, go pray and I'll send you guys a spirit. You know, they prayed for 50 days. They were, from the moment that Jesus resurrected for 50 days, they would gather up and pray and pray and pray. Not one, two, three. You know, they could have said after the 10th day, no, God, what are we doing here? Are you coming or not? What are, you, are you giving us this? What's happening? How many of us would have been just as willing to keep this constant rhythm? 50 days marathon of prayer. Every evening, you know, you finish prayer, you come pray. You, fin you finish work, you come pray. After 10 days, after a week, you know, I could see you guys already tiring out. 50 days. 50 days. These people would gather up and pray. What I want to tell you guys is the following. Maybe recreate in the context, you don't have this sensation that you expected for. Maybe you expected something extraordinary and it didn't happen. But I provoke you, recreate the context. Because we cannot manipulate the Spirit of the Lord in any way. I come from a Pentecostal context where a long time we Pentecostals believe that we know the recipe to bring the Spirit. We have our specific songs that we bring them out when we need them. We create the atmosphere. We pray louder. We shout. And things like this happen. And we believe that we can bring the Spirit. But no, we can't. The Spirit comes when He wants. God sends the Spirit when He wants. But we need to create the context for Him to come. The place for Him to come. You know, last Friday I had from the Lord a very interesting word. Uh, you know, when I uh, when I pray, some, some, sometimes this, I receive a message from the Lord. It doesn't happen often, but I received it last night on Friday. And um, I received the word on, on Friday that, uh, you know, someone couldn't pray because someone had a question. And his question was, why do we need to shout when we pray? And, they, and the Lord didn't discover me, the person that, that had this question. But at the end, I, I felt like I, I should say it. But I had no peace until, you know, I, I felt like I, I wasn't going to tell them anything. But I, I eventually opened to, to Hebrews 5, 7. And I want you guys to remember this passage. Hebrews 5, 7. During the days during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with, ferv with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because, he was, uh, he w because of his reverent submission. When you're in a critic situation, you, know, you cannot ask for help uh, in, uh, with a whisper. That's why sometimes I shout because I'm desperate. I want an answer. I want for God to do things. I want God to move things around. I, I want this. So it's not a way for us to, to stand out, but it's a way of 
our desperation. It's a natural reaction. That's how Jesus used to pray. And may the Lord help us understand this. You know, we shout, we go to football. I don't understand this. People are, are scared that we shout when we when we pray. But have you ever gone to a stadium, to a football stadium? <laughs> We're nothing compared to them. <laughs> you, you expect people to shout at a stadium. But why not at church? No, we don't want to... We want to come with the same energy. So let's go through the through the signs. Suddenly, verse 2, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. The apostle and the evangelist, uh, Luca, the guy that writes the, the book of Acts, describes the first manifestation of the Spirit as that of a strong wind. It wasn't a wind. There wasn't a wind that came, but there was a sound like the 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 like one of a wind. There was a sort of blowing sound, you know, when there's those summer winds and the wind blows and it has a, sp a specific sound. It was something like that, a a strong howling blow, a a a a loud sound. This manifestation of the spirit. The, uh, this manifestation of the spirit. Along with it falls a, a supernatural power over the people that were in that house at the time. The first sign, the strong uh, sound, describes and, and reminds us that alongside the, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, a power falls, a supernatural power falls over, the, over those people and say Amen. The promise that once alongside the, the, the coming of the Spirit into the life of a person, that person receives a special power. Along with the coming of the Spirit in his life, people people that receive the Spirit receive us a special power. Listen to what Acts 1.8 says. But you will receive a power? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. But you will receive a power. But I want to underline something here. The Holy Spirit isn't an energy, isn't a, a power. Isn't The Holy Spirit is a, is a person that you can you have a relationship with. You can sadden, you can make them happy. You can. It's a, it's a person that you have a relationship with. The Holy Spirit is not an energy, a power. But it's a person. And that's why the scripture says that the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. Romans chapter 8. We don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit, like a good friend, says, let me let me help you and guides you. I'll show you which way to go, how to, to, to speak, what to say. They love us alongside the coming of the Spirit that is a, a, a person in my life and fills me up with power. And I want to make another clarification here that is important. A man has multiple experiences in... Uh, multiple experiences in their relationship with, with the Spirit. God the Father, the Creator, was involved with the creation like all other, all, all, like Jesus and, and the, the Spirit. God is implicated in all His work, in all the Trinity together. But there are moments, historic moments, where we meet and we see uh, a, a work of one of the Trinity, one, one, one person in the Trinity, even though it's part of all of God. We have God the Father that we see in work maybe more visibly, even if you know, all the whole Trinity works together at a, at, at, at a time. But we see God the Father more visibly with His work in, with, the, with the Jews, with Jerusalem. Jesus, we see him uh, in the New Testament, we see him work, work differently, but from the moment that he is lifted up to heaven, after Jesus died for us, after he, 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 the Messiah came, he says that I will go up to the Father and I'll send you guys someone else. You know, we speak of the same God. But another thing, you know, when a man is resurrected and is born again, they are filled up with God, not just of, of, with one person, but with everything. But there's a difference between the moment that we are born again and the moment that we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I've showed you this before and I'll, I'll say it again. I'll give you the image between me and my boy, Namia. He's my boy since the day he was born. He will, he carries my name, he'll get everything I have after I die. He'll be my child now when he's three years old and when he'll be 40. And if God holds me alive till then. <laughs> you know, <it's laughs> when I'll have, when he'll have 40 years of age, I'll be 60. Long time, long time since then. But he'll be my child throughout the, the his whole life. Nothing will change. Now, 
But there's a big difference between Naomi and my child, my in everything, my child at three years of age, and Naomi at at eighteen twenty. When he becomes a partner, I can uh, rest on him. I, you know, if we need to go somewhere, I can have him drive my car. I can give him responsibilities. He shares with me everything. You know, the moment when we're born again, we become children of God. We are His. But God wants us not only to be His, his children, but to be partners, to be involved in, in, his, in his work with this world. And He makes us capable, gives us uh, power, pours into us something, something more, which is the, 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 the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But, but the moment we're filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in it, the word of the Scripture says that alongside with this presence, this special presence of the Lord in our life comes... Uh, alongside a, a, a supernatural power a supernatural power but where can this power be seen where can it be quantified where in witness in testifying Peter stands up preaches the gospel in a way that it, he never had before God wants his power to be seen in your life when you speak to others preach to others when you're a witness of his to the people that you speak with, they need to feel that God is speaking to them through you. Do you have this experience? You know, you speak and people say, you know, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting goosebumps. I don't know what you're telling me, but I don't. it's not you talking. And you don't need to shout at someone for this to happen. I want you to remember the authority, the power needs to, 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 to be seen in, in, uh, when, you, when you're preaching, when you're being a witness of, of Christ. And, you know, we don't have time today. I wanted to preach you the whole chapter, but I realized that the one hour isn't enough. If you see in the middle of this chapter, what is there? It's the gospel. After the moment when the, 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 the Spirit comes down and the, the apostles are given power, Peter preaches and presents the gospel. God, Christ came into the world, died, was resurrected, went up to heaven. Repent, he will judge us all. That's what, Apost that's what Peter, Apostle Peter is preaching. Because God created this, this context where the gospel, for, for the Holy Spirit to come to help us preach the gospel. Now, I want to ask you, when you preach the gospel, do you feel like the Holy Spirit of the Lord is, is coming over you? You know, don't understand me differently. Sometimes when I, I preach, it doesn't happen all the times. But I start, I look at you guys and I, I preach and I feel like someone puts a, a heavy cloak on me. You know, other times uh, I feel you guys getting bored. I get bored. I feel like sleeping. I get sleepy. I get tired. But sometimes something different happens and the atmosphere changes because there's a great difference. A great difference between the moment where you work under this, this power of the Spirit and when you just do it normally. Do you have this experience? You know? Do you have this experience constantly? Super, this supernatural power needs to be seen when we speak to others, when we confront with others with the, the truth of the Gospel, when we speak to them about the love of, of God. Apostle Paul says clearly, it's useless if I, if I tell you 10,000 words that you don't understand. I'll tell you the couple that you need to hear and everything will change. You can preach for 40 minutes and sometimes doesn't happen and things don't, nothing changes. Sometimes you, I'm sorry. Sometimes you can preach for 40 minutes and nothing changes. And other times you can speak 10 words and you change people's whole lives. Peter Roberts, the guy that changed the whales. There's stories where he would go into church, uh, put on his knee, put himself on his knees, pray, preach for three minutes, and people would come to the front and, and give up their lives and, and truly repented. Because what changes lives is God's authority. So, power can be seen when we preach to others, when we're a witness of His. But this power can also be seen in prayer. We're not used to, to use uh, spiritual power physically. You know, the Holy Spirit is over me. I can now lift 200 kilogram weights. And we're not talking about physical power here, but about a spiritual power. And I want you not to forget that, that prayer is a war. And that's why it's hard, it's hard for us to pray. Prayer isn't a, a relaxing jog down the street. No, prayer is a marathon. And when you start praying, you'll see that you feel like you're hungry, you're, you're, you're thirsty, your phone rings, your children cry. You're, till then, they used to sleep for, for two hours in the evening. But now that you want to pray, they won't sleep for 10 minutes. You go in the car and you say, God, I have 10 minutes to pray here. And then as soon as you do, uh, they put a parking ticket. They, they start beeping their horns at you. 
something happens always because prayer is a spiritual war. There's a great difference between a fighter that uh, falls down in his armor, he cannot carry it, but a warrior that, that is efficient. Ephesians says, be efficient war warriors of the Lord. People that in their spiritual war hit the bullseye 100% of the time. You know, we're in this situation and we pray for Israel. Israel hits once a day. You know, they send constantly hundreds of, of rockets a day. They won't, they're unable to hit even 10% of them. Israel hits uh, the pastimes once. And that's the difference. When a spiritual, when when a man learns to fight in the spiritual field, learns to pray, he becomes a warrior. That that the whole uh, whole of, of of the devil's army starts to fear. Is this power, the supernatural power, visible in your life? Is your prayer a a efficient weapon against the devil, against his works? Apostle Paul in Ephesians six says that you know we're not fighting against meat and bone and and blood. But we're fighting against the heavenly realms. We're fighting against the devil himself, the spiritual realm. You have a, a colleague of work, you have a neighbor, you have a husband, a wife that is permanently in conflict with you. The one who works in the, in the, in behind the scenes is the devil. Who makes you, who makes her be permanently nervous, uh, annoyed, the Holy Spirit? No, we are between two worlds. Whoever isn't with God is from the other side, full stop. That's why it's important when you understand this to hit uh, the target exactly. You know, you can argue with them endlessly. But I remember a situation I was with a pastor at a, a uh, conciliation, you know, and the people that we were, con con we were conciliating with were full of, of uh, hell, of demons. And, you know, I, I told my brother, you know, we could, it's useless speaking to demons. They need to be taken out in the name of Jesus. When you understand this, it's useless to argue with him or her. Go pray and pray for him. Liberate him and liberate her. Liberate my, my colleague, my boss from the demons that are, have put ownership over his life. It's useless to fight with the person because it's useless. You can argue with him for two months till uh, the whole night. Though. When you understand, you become efficient, you become strong and you see how things change. Prayer is a strong weapon. Just for the people that know how to use it and they are strong in it. I ask, is this power visible in your life? Spiritual power isn't proportional with, with uh, physical power. You know, you might see a big strong lad and you might be a child spiritually. Have no strength, be unable to, to lift even a, a single prayer to heaven. Our physical capabilities don't prove anything in the spiritual realm, but it's our interior resources. I want to remind you guys of something interesting. The sons of, of Sheva uh, started uh, pulling out demons. And the moment they tried to exercise a demon, the demon from them and, uh, started asking them questions. You know, They used to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, that Apostle Paul was preaching, I, uh, we command you to, to get out. And the demons uh, answered, you know, we know Paul, we know Jesus, but who are you guys? Who are you guys? You know, does the devil know who you are? Are you feared? Are you on the most wanted list? The public enemy list in, in hell? Is the devil against you with his whole force? Oh, uh, let me give you guys an example. For a time period, I, I preached uh, in that area from Siget to Ukraine. There's about 40,000 Romanians in that area. And I operated there with my friend uh, Florin Pop and a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses there. And Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians. Full stop, they don't believe in Jesus. These guys are pagans that need to be evangelized. When a Jehovah Witness comes to you, you know, you, you don't speak to them. You know, he hides, he speaks about Jesus, but he doesn't know anything, he doesn't believe anything. When you start to really picking his brain, you know, you find out that Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians. They are worse than any other Christian denomination. Right. So we started preaching the gospel there. And I remember a situation when I was with him in Bucharest. And in Bucharest, there's the biggest temple of uh, Jehovah uh, Witnesses from, from the region. Bunch of them there. Now, and what was interesting, what I found interesting is that when we went there, we couldn't enter except the, for a little bit. They had a list of people that they were against. And they knew about them. And the name of Florin Pop was there. They knew about it. They were on the list. They knew that they were a person that fights against their organization, a man that is at war with them. 
And I want to ask you, you know, on the list of people most wanted in hell, that the people try to think of strategies on a daily basis to fight against them, are you there? Are you a man that all of hell is afraid of? Are you a man of this type of spiritual power that when you enter a place, the atmosphere changes? The Lord on Jesus said that we are carriers of peace. You know, when you enter a house, your peace must fall over that house. An authority, a spiritual authority comes with you to bring peace in any place that you go in. Does the spiritual power come that changes things radically when you enter through the door? That's what we're talking about here. Spiritual authority is carried. You know, a man that carries this power is wins it through prayer and makes you efficient, makes you strong, changes things around you. It protects you spiritually. Brother Mashtaragyu, a, a teacher from my uni, uh, my brother is about, my, my friend is about this tall. Small, tiny, not too big, but a man with, with uh, a lot of passion. And he said that um, he was in a church in a little uh, village and there was a bunch of politics there and, and he had a conflict there and he was speaking to the people and telling them the truth that they needed to repent, that the people picked them up, took them outside and wanted to, to beat them up. The men from the church took him up, flung him out the door in the court of the church to, to beat him up for what he, he preached. And Brother Meshnaraki was, was telling us an interesting thing, you know, he was on the floor and the Holy Spirit told them, draw a line, draw a line on the ground. And I stood up and I drew a line. And I told them, God tells you, if you pass this line here, you're fighting with God and not me. And Brother Masharag was, 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 was telling us how the angry people would run against him and they were, they, were, they, were, they were hitting a sort of plexiglass. But even in their madness, they didn't wake up. That God was there. And I want to tell you, this supernatural power protects you in an extraordinary way. I felt God's protection over me in so many different contexts. I've seen, I've had moments where demon attacks at night in my family. I've seen how this power of God floods my life and protects me and throws fear away, throws, throws, throws desperation away. This is what we're talking about here. The power of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of, of this strong howling wind describes a supernatural power, a great supernatural power that is seen in, in witnessing and in, in, in prayer efficiency. But it carries on and says that some tongues like fire were seen uh, amongst them. Verse, verse uh, 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. What were these tongues of fire? And you know, we cannot uh, untie these, these tongues of fire that is also presented in, in Luke. But I'll read from Matthew 3. If, I, if we go to, to Matthew 3, verse 10. The axe is already at the roots of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into his barn and burning up the chaff. With, un with, with unquenchable fire. It's so clear that the, the coming of the Spirit, this falling of the Spirit, brings with it and is in a context of cleansing, of purifying, of a, a clean life, a holy life. I repeat again and I tell you, holy for us doesn't mean perfect. And this is the problem when, you, when we ask for, when we, we call each other holy. We're not talking about perfection, we're talking about dedication. We're talking about dedication. A holy man doesn't sin? No, there's a difference. But there's a difference between a lamb and a pig. The most clear way that I can explain you this. A, a lamb, you clean him. If he, he, he falls in the mud, a lamb will, will, will uh, rub itself against every fence, every tree to try and clean itself. When you take a pig, you throw him in the mud, clean him, he will dive as quickly as he can back in the mud. There's a difference between a man who's holy and, and wants to clean himself and can't stand being dirty and a man that's like a pig and goes into sin and dwells in sin and loves to stay in sin. When the Holy Spirit of the Lord falls over us, it provokes us to a new life, a holy life.
The presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives brings brings with it a a greater standard of of, of for our lives, a greater standard of of holifying ourselves. The tongues of fire over the the people were like the the coils uh, the coals taken from the fire and then put on the tongue of Isaiah. And I say it was a prophet of the Lord. He wasn't a notorious sinner. But God says, before I can use you, I need to clean you. And there are many people that are clean and of God, but God, before, fills, before He fills you with the Holy Spirit, He cleans you again. He washes things from your life again. He, bring, he makes you holy. It's a symbol of cleansing. The tongues of fire are a symbol of cleansing. I want to clarify something very important here. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a reward for good acts, for good deeds. A man that fasts, prays and believes that he has done a ritual doesn't receive a special favor from the Lord to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No. The condition is being born again. God doesn't baptize with the Holy Spirit people that aren't born again. That's the condition. But it doesn't matter that if you born again or a baby two of two days old or a child of six months, six years, 25 year old child. And these guys still exist, but being spiritual baby for 25 years, the same, uh, everything annoys him, everything produces uh, annoyances, they judge everyone. They, babies for 25 years. Anyway, doesn't matter what level you're at. It doesn't matter what position you're at. The Holy Spirit of the Lord is given to you as a gift. That's what God, in His grace, in His, in His, uh, with His good heart, He gives you. This He gives you this spirit, this power. And when it comes over you, and you know, don't be amazed when you look. You know, this guy. How how was he? Some people are shocked. You know, this guy. This guy has the Holy Spirit. God doesn't work like you want to, but like He wants. He, like he God works in the way He wants to. And as soon as a a a man receives the Holy Spirit, he is called to a higher standard, a higher standard of living. Imposes a new standard of, of uh, you know, if, if until then you've allowed yourself to lie a little bit, to play, to be double-faced. God cleanses you and brings you to a new standard. There are things that you cannot do, you cannot go back on. He brings a reform in your life. And I ask you, is the presence of the Holy Spirit visible? visible in your life does it clean you have you have you been filled with the holy spirit you're filled let's let's assume you are filled you, you say that you're a man full of the holy spirit is in your life the presence of the holy spirit visible as as a what, how is your life looking does it you have this 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 thing in you that pushes you to to come to the lord listen to how interesting uh, one john says if we flick to 1 John chapter 2 verse 27 um, As for you, the anointing you received from Him remains in you and you do not need anyone to teach you but as His anointing teaches you about all things and as that anointing is real, no counterfeit just as it has taught you, remain in Him when was the last time that the Holy Spirit spoke about the attitude that you've had? The last experience that I've had, I called a friend and I was a bit harsh with him. And as soon as I closed my phone, you know, even if I was, after my opinion, in the right, completely justified. But as soon as I closed my phone, the Holy Spirit rang, uh, <laughs> rang me up and said, listen, you haven't done, you, have, you haven't, uh, uh, it's, uh, what you've done hasn't been good. And I called him back up and I apologized. I told him, you know, the Spirit spoke to me. I, I'm in the wrong. When was the last time that the Spirit spoke to you? Censored you? Put some censorship on you. Put, hit the brakes in your life. How sensitive are you at these, these, uh, at, at these whispers from the Holy Spirit? At, do you feel how the Holy Spirit helps you lead a holy life? Or do you always need a... a, a uh, hard blow to the head to, to take you left to take you right you know we sp do you need god to smack you left and right to keep you on his path you know you see yourself going straying away you feel god's god's heavy hand slapping you back on back on his path do you feel the holy spirit conducting you helping you bring peace bring your family together speak to people 
show you when you're wrong. When was the, when was the last time that the Holy Spirit spoke to you? Showed you which way to, to go, what words to say? Does the Holy Spirit guide you? Do you feel its direct guidance? All those who are children of God are, are, are guided by God. And the last sign that I want us to speak about is this strange speaking. You know, they were all filled with the Spirit. All of them that were filled with the Holy Spirit began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Luke doesn't explain this in the text. You know, wind, fire, shortly he explains it briefly. But over this sign, Evangelist uh, Luca uh, gives, gives explanation. Verse 5. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation of the heaven. You know, they, these weren't random people, weak people without character. These people were people with character, with personality. They were God-fearing people. You know, to come from Rome to Jerusalem just to, to celebrate this, so to come and... and, and Praise God, pray. You know, it was you had to. <laughs> there was some time. These people cared about the religion. They had a high standard of, of belief, of faith. These people were in Jerusalem when this this great sound was heard. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of them hear us in our own native tongues, in our own native language? And then he goes on to list a bunch of languages. Uh, Perithian, Medes, Elamites, residents, Mesopotamia, Asia. When the scripture speaks about Asia, uh, it speaks about... Uh, modern day Turkey we speak about uh, the countries around the Mediterranean Sea Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt uh, Cyrene, Rome Cretans, Arabians all these, all these different countries and all these different tongues and they were all perplexed we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues amazed and perplexed they, they asked one another what does this mean? In the year 50 AD, when this, this, uh, these Gospels are being written and the Book of Acts is written, everything that they knew about the world was what the Roman Empire had conquered. That's why they believed that Spain is the edge of the world, nothing, nothing beyond. Because that's all they knew. And Luke refers to this end of the world to these, these uh, places on the heaven. And he groups these, these languages, and I didn't want to bring you too many informations. If you're curious, you'll see that they are a group from east to the west. It's a passing of each region, a representation of all the people that were from, well, from all regions comprised of the known world at that time. There was a multilingual society then, no, a multicultural group of people. They were all Jews at their origin, but they were scattered across the whole Roman Empire. Religious people, faithful people, faithful people. they weren't people of nothing. That's why their, their words, their experiences are, are worth uh, taking a look at. The experience of the, of the uh, disciples were confirmed by these people. They were all amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? If we go back to, to verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Now, uh, verse 7, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Why does, why does this question come up, Galileans? You know, Galileans were the people that were the least educated. You know, there's a region, usually in every country, where the people there tend to have a slightly lower IQ than the rest of the country. In Galilee, there were people that had, that were poor, that were low educated, that had the lowest, uh, uh, that did the lowest jobs. Back then, they also had a problem in, in, he, in the Hebrew language, there's a bunch of consonants that are, that are spoken with the neck. I won't show you how, but they come from the neck. Like in French, there are a bunch of them that are from the nose. 
they you, you speak from the nose but a lot in, in, in Hebrew there's a bunch of them that come from from the neck and the Galileans didn't know how to pronounce them and they would also eat uh, syllables they would speak in a certain way where they would cut out letters cut out words their language their, the way of speaking was was pretty poor and when these uh, Jews you know like us ex educated people people that lived in, in Rome weren't the same that lived in I don't know some back end streets and, and when you live in London things your mind is, is open up to you you see that these people have have done things differently have invented things differently they come with a different mentality whether you want it or not when you come and hopefully in better in bad in some areas and that's why we need to take care but these people would come and say you know these guys are from Galilee the Galileans how did these guys end up knowing how to speak Greek how to speak Arab Arabic Latin how did these people know how to speak all these languages what's happening here it, it, so many different tongues so many different languages on in, 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 in one spot when did they gain all this knowledge that's why their shock was a lot bigger when they heard this Galileans these weak people speaking their tongues their languages and not anything but praising God now what is this speaking in other tongues Glossalia, the, the theological term. What does speaking in other, in other tongues mean? It's a supernatural sign that, uh, that, that uh, shows the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a person. Say Amen. We see this everywhere in the book of Acts. The speaking in tongues is a supernatural sign that accompanies the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a man. Where people that are filled with the Spirit can testify the beautiful things, uh, the beautiful works of God in an inspired tongue unlearned before an unlearned tongue what tongue that you don't control it's not from you it's not a tongue that you learn it's not a language that you learn and I want us to go quickly through a clarification is there a difference between speaking in different uh, tongues here in Acts and 1 Corinthians that we've studied together yes there is a difference and I want us to, to clarify a few things here that are important in the book of Acts, the speaking in tongues is uh, for the public. It's for the uh, for other people. They spoke in other tongues for others to hear. God allowed the speaking of uh, or the speaking of tongues here in Acts to be for the use of others. Whilst in one Corinthians, the speaking of the tongues is for me, for my personal building. The, 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 the goal is different. In the book of Acts, uh, they are understood by the people that, are, that, that hear them. In Corinthians, uh, it says that only if these words are translated and only if God has a, a desire for this. You know, it's many times even the person that, that, that prays doesn't know what it is that he's saying. The speaking in tongues is not a language, but it's a, it's a way of speaking in, in 1 Corinthians. You don't need to find the grammar, the, the certain words, the similes. The, don't search to, to bring the speaking in tongues to, to uh, subdue it under the criteria of the tongues today. It's something different. In the book of Acts, it's a sign that attests to the presence of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians, is a gift. What does this mean? I believe that a man can be filled with the Holy Spirit once to speak in tongues and never again. Even though, even though, I believe that this gift is for every Christian. I don't see why God would give the grace of a person to build, to, to, I don't know why God would give the grace of, of building up uh, one person through the use of, of speaking in tongues to one person and not to another. That's why I want it. Wish it. Wish to have this experience, this supernatural experience of speaking in tongues. That's why I also believe that a man can be filled with the Holy Spirit even without speaking in tongues. They're not restrictive. I don't believe that only if you, you, you. But there's a gift that needs to be manifested. Healing, miracles, uh, wisdom, prof prophetic gifts. The, when the Spirit comes over you, there's always something that happens there, a manifestation of, a, of, 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 of His power. Both in Acts and in Corinth, we, have to, we, we, we see the same experience, but with two different uh, uh, aims. 
the same experience with two different names. In 1 Corinthian, it's personal, it's not understood, and it's a gift that accompanies my personal life. And sometimes through food translation helps others. In Acts, we, we're talking about a public uh, speaking of tongues, one that is understood, and a sign that attests to the, to the Holy Spirit's uh, presence. Now, another question arises. Does today, you know, is, are there still people today that are known to have spoken in, in different languages like this? And I love to use this example of uh, Brother Tipe. I love this story so much that he says that he knows personally. He was uh, the collector of this story. And he, he says that at one point in the communism uh, times, Gorgi uh, Gorgiotesh, Ceausescu, the president at the time, was really softer. But at the, the beginning, Gorgi Gorgiotesh, the communism in Romania was ferocious. In this period of time, the Greek Catholic Church was illegal, were closed in mass. And I want to make a, 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 a little point here. If you want to read a good story, read about the stories of the communist uh, jails, the Christian, the Christians locked up in, in communist jails. Uh, Radu Cir, Brother Vulbrand. Read about them. Andonescu. I picked up uh, his book uh, this week and read some of his stories again. You're not allowed to not read this. These books are amazing. It tells how the communists destroyed Radu Gigi, made him betray his beliefs, and how this had a mass effect over ever, and how this de destroyed mentally the, the fall of a leader. I, I recommend that you guys read it. Now, communism at that time uh, persecuted the brothers. They weren't allowed to meet up, they were beaten up. And Brother Tipe was saying that in a, in a village, a, a officer came over the house, the prayer even. The officer went into the house of a group of people that were praying. And whilst the officer was ready to beat them up, brothers at the time had had a, a habit of whilst they were praying whilst they were beaten up they would pray you know when you're being beaten up and someone uh, and you're, you're praying you you withstand pain differently it got uh, it's like an anesthetic for them and as the officers were beating uh, them up the brothers started praying and whilst they were praying a old woman started speaking in a perfect French the general at that time uh, had a had a uh, the colonel the, the the general of the, those officers um, had a French wife and knew how to speak French and this old woman was praying and she didn't have any education she spoke to him in a perfect French and and says if you touch these people I God will will. Uh, put my hand over you uh, and this guy was perfect this, they stopped he stopped dead in his tracks ordered or he stopped dead in his tracks and ordered his um, his officers to stop as well God works through the speaking of, of, of other other languages and God has a specific plan for, for speaking in tongues in other languages and it's unknown because God works in mysterious ways through it but what was the the, the aim of this sign on that day what was it God wanted to underline the uni the, 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 the extreme reach of, of God's works, the universal, the, how universal it is. And you know, the Jews thought that it was only for them. I remind you, I remind you in Acts 10, 14, 15, Peter goes to the, 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 cons the council in uh, Israel and apologizes and goes, you know, I went to Cornelius and, you know, he was apologizing to them. If you read the text, you know, brothers, don't, don't be angry. I didn't, God sent me to Cornelius. So I didn't want to go. But why? Because even the Jews, the disciples still believed that the, 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 the other nations were pagans, had no chance of, of, of being repented. And that's why Apostle, uh, God speaks to Apostle Peter and says, What I have cleansed, don't call unclean. That's why the moment when the Holy Spirit gave uh, the ability for other people to speak in tongues, to speak in other languages, was the signal to, the, to, to, the, to, 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 to show the Jews that the access to the truth is universal, that this salvation is for everyone. The curse from uh, uh, Babel was, was cleaned. 
it was cleansed. Let's do some biblical his history. At the Tower of Babel, the people tried to build a tower, obviously. But why did they want to build a tower? What was the point? To do what? Why did they want to build a tower? Joseph as Flavius brings something else uh, from the Juda Judaic tradition. You know what the Jews used to do? They build with bricks and, and uh, put dried mud on, on the side. Why? Because instead of them, instead of them uh, repenting when the, the flood came, they used to calculate, you know, how tall was the the uh, fl the great flood. You know, it went to the to about this height on the mountains. What the, what was their what was their plan? Their plan was to build a, a huge tower so that it could could uh, uh, rise above the water levels. And how small we are with our minds sometimes. Instead of them repenting, they, they wanted to build a tower above the water. And God, in a sympathetic way, He doesn't send fire from heaven, doesn't harm them, doesn't. But He, he split their tongues up. And over overnight, over a couple of, of hours, minutes, till yesterday, you know, we all speak in the same language. And all of a sudden now. God, you know, you ask for a hammer in Italian and some guy answers you in Chinese. And now here in Acts, God brings all these languages and gives them the truth in them. The Old Testament was in Hebrew back then. They didn't have access to the truth. And then Septuaginta was translated into Greek late. But till then people didn't have access to the truth. But God does something and makes the truth accessible to everyone. Through the Holy Spirit to every nation, any nation. Hallelujah, even to us today. A man full of the Holy Spirit needs to uh, be freed of any judgmental thoughts when he preaches the truth. A man who's full of the Holy Spirit needs to be freed of any judgments. I've, I've had... I used to be a very judgmental person. I didn't have trust in uh, uh, gypsies. And I was, you know, I was educated that gypsies steal, take our children. You know, have you guys not heard these stories? You know, I was threatened as a kid that when you, if you're bad, if you're naughty, gypsies will come and steal you. And no matter how uh, how open-minded you are, these uh, generalizations influence you. And I was in Romania, and I, I had a group of gypsy brothers who invited me over for dinner. And all my life, I, I judged these people, I had generalizations of these people. And I was sitting there, and I love the Gypsy Brothers now. They are my friends, you know, and now I've, I've become so passionate of them, even more than I love Romanian people. And I'll tell you why. There's a beautiful culture to the Gypsies. They give you a fork and a knife at the table only to respect you. But they'd prefer if you eat it with, the, with your hand, because that's how they eat. And I was there, and I didn't know what to do. And my friend Pauline Popo told me, stretch your hand out and eat. And I prayed back then. I said, God, now I want you to free me of any judgmental thoughts that I have. And I, I, I stretched my hand and I ate the, the, the best food that I ate in my life. And I still go back then. And his uh, brother Abel and his wife cooks amazingly. There's nothing better than their traditional food. And I started eating. And he stood up and he said, you're, you're, my, you're our brother now. Free yourselves of generalizations of, you know, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. A man of God is freed from any judgments. You know, I don't know how many of you guys wake up at 2 a.m. to take me out of my home. But if I call my friend Kostika, the gypsy, he will, he will uh, go. He, I, I'm willing to bet if I call him at 2 a.m., he will come. He will on the first flight to England and, and bring you whatever he needs. You know, I remember at 2 a.m. I, I forgot uh, the keys to my house uh, at, at his home. And, he, you know, other people would have called me and say, you know, brother, go book a hotel for the night and I'll bring you tomorrow morning. No, the guy got in his car and brought me the keys at about 2, 3 a.m. We have so many people here. We have Polish people that fragment our church. We have you know, Serbians we have, and we pray for people of all nationalities. Don't head off with prejudgments. The gospel is universal and it's, it's for every person. Don't judge people on their education. You know, they're too smart. You know, this guy's too smart. Why should I preach him the gospel? Because God through you might 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 save a banker. You know, this guy is. You know, what can you tell this guy? And I've been in a situation where I had to preach to people that didn't know how to read. And you know, come on, you don't know how to read. You know, get out of my face. 
No, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, come on, speak even to him, even to him. You speak to people that have low intellectual, but you know, you know their mind remain closed. Go to them, explain it to them through stories, show them with flowers, with wheat, find imageries, find, find ways to explain it to them. Free yourself of any prejudgmental thoughts, any, any, if you're racist, if you're, if you have any, if you feel like you're, 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 you have these, these, these chains in your mind, free yourself of them in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't make it, don't feel like it's too, too, don't feel like you're going too low, too high up. Get off any high horse, get up on any high horse to preach to people. I've read an interesting story that a gospel, that an evangelist went to the Americas. And the Americas were firstly jails. The first people that went into the continent of America, they were uh, jailmates, uh, prisoners. You know, if you go to America, if you survive good, if not, then God with mercy. That was the idea. It was an exile. You know, you've done stupid things here, they would embark you on a ship and ship you off to America, throw you there. And I heard an interesting story that the missionaries from here, from Great Britain, went to preach to the people there. And what can a man do when he starts off from zero? He becomes a, a farmer. And he went to preach to a cowboy, you know. Cowboy sounds good in English, but it means cow herders. People that, that took care of, of cows. People that didn't take, have any, people that didn't want educated. And you, you know, when you deal with cows, you know, life is simple. You go to them, you make sure that you, you, they eat, you, you take milk from them, you make sure that they aren't eaten by any wolves. And when they went there, they started preaching about Jesus. And these guys were preaching about homoousius and the difference between God the Father and uh, the substance. And he realized that things, uh, these guys weren't understanding anything. And he started telling them the story about how Jesus went into Jerusalem. And he took a little, a little uh, donkey and went into Jerusalem. And then they called into the Lord. And these, these people decided, you know, we want to turn to, to, to Christ. You know, why were you, why do you guys want to turn back to, to, to Jesus? Because he's strong, these guys said. What do you mean? How, how, why is he strong? Well, they said, you know, when, when a man drives on a donkey for the first time, a, a tiny donkey, a, a, a child donkey, you need strong hands to be able to lead the donkey left and right because he's, he's a wild animal. Jesus is strong. We want to tend to him. The Holy Spirit is capable on, on speaking. To, the Holy Spirit is capable of speaking to everyone and anyone, no matter their intellectual level, no matter... Nothing matters. If you allow yourself to be inspired, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, speaks to any man through you. Do you feel the supernatural guidance when you preach the gospel? Do you preach the gospel? When was the last time that you allowed yourself to be led by the Spirit to speak to a man? A man full of the Holy Spirit cannot speak. Only You can only speak about the beautiful works of, of God because the Spirit doesn't know how to speak about anything else. You know, do you know people that can only, that only speak about Jesus, that no matter what the, you speak to them, you always, uh, they always find a way to speak to you about Jesus. You know, I want to end by asking you, do you have these visible signs in your life? This power, this cleansing, and this unity, this universality. You're ready to give yourself to anyone and everyone without any prejudgments, any standards imposed by you. You're going to speak. Well, I'm not going to speak to this guy. This guy's too low for me. A man of God isn't allowed to have these sort of thoughts. Do these experiences, are they part of your life? When a man is full of the Holy Spirit, signs show up, they're visible. They, they, they follow him, they, they, they're almost like a CV for him. Are you full of the Holy Spirit? I'd like us to pray now at the end and I want this to be our prayer. God, I want to be full of your Spirit. But I want only to be full of your Spirit so that... I don't want to be filled with the Holy Spirit just for me to know, but I want supernatural signs. Signs in my prayer, signs when I, when I speak to others. When I pray, I want the whole, the whole of, of hell to shake. I want to receive your power. I want to become an efficient 
warrior for you, Claude. I want to be clean. I want to be a standard for, for everyone around me. I want to be as far away from sin as possible and as close to you and to be freed of any racist thoughts, any prejudgments, any generalizations. You know, today I'll meet with my uh, colleague at work, I'll meet with, a, with my mechanic, I need to go fix my car, I'll meet with my courier, with my landlord, with my... Lord, give me a, a word for him, give me, give, me, give me something to tell him. Tell me what to tell this guy. Let's pray. Let's stand up and pray for these visible signs to be visible in our lives. Amen.